Hello, everyone. I am here today with Joe Polizzi, the godfather of content marketing and also the founder of Content Marketing Institute, the leading education and training organization for content marketing, which includes the largest in-person content marketing event in the world called Content Marketing World, which I highly, highly suggest everyone consider going to. Joe is also the winner of 2014 John Caldwell Lifetime Achievement Award from the Content Council. Uh, Joe released his fourth book recently called Content Inc., which, uh, and his third book, Epic Content Marketing, was named one of the five must-read business books of 2013 by Fortune Magazine. And as always, if you ever see Joe in person, he will be wearing orange. And today, we are going to be talking about Joe's fourth book, Content Inc., and the Content Inc. model. Joe, how are you doing today? David, I, I could not be better. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And by the way, I'm wearing orange even on a podcast. Even on so a podcast? You don't have to worry about that. Even, <laughs> Head I to wear toe? orange every day. Just <laughs> Do you case really? I have to go outside. Just in case I have to go out of the house, I wear orange because you never know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Well, every now and then put a little burn orange shade on that for my uh, U, my uh, UT Longhorns, if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely do. We love all uh, variations and tones of and PMF variations of orange, so we're we're good to go there. <laughs> well, that's awesome, man. That's your trademark, and you made it happen. Um, so to kind of just uh, dig into everything here, uh, for, for those who aren't familiar uh, with the Content Inc. model, can you, can, can, we, can you quickly go through it and why it works so well for small and large ben, uh, businesses when it comes to content marketing? Just kind of a, a well, review. It, absolutely, yeah. Just to give an overview, I mean, Basically, I wrote Epic Content Marketing, and, and as you said, in 2013, and I, and I have a goal of writing a book every two years, and I'm like, okay, well, what's, what's this one going to be on? And, and actually, I had more and more people come up to me from smaller businesses saying, Joe, you know, we loved Epic, but it was really geared toward larger businesses, larger marketers, and it was. It absolutely is true. And I'm like, well, you know, can we do something for smaller businesses, startups, and entrepreneurs? And so what we did is we just started researching a lot of different companies that became successful using a content marketing approach. And we found 20, 30, 40 different amazing examples of content marketing working for even in large businesses, but basically where there was no budget available, where they did it a lot, in most cases, on a shoestring. So what we did is we found those case studies and we reverse engineered the model. And the team and I, we were basically asking the question, well, is there anything predictable in their model? Can we basically reverse engineer those case studies and find out are there things in common where you or I can then take that program and say, look, if we follow this model, we can actually um, monetize that content in some way, whatever the goal might be. And the great thing, David, is we actually found that there were six steps. Every company that we found takes six steps uh, they they do it at different times. It's not always perfectly symmetrical when you look at the times, but they all did the exact same six things, and we can talk about some of those. But basically, the first two are strategy. You find out the sweet spot, which is basically the story that you need to be telling, the story you should be telling. And then the second portion is the content tilt, and that's all about am I actually telling a different story that's going to break through all the content clutter. So before you create any content, it's all about building that strategy. The next step is building the base. And what we found out, David, is, is that instead of telling your story and spreading it all over every, every channel you could possibly think of, you actually focus on one content type, one platform, and you consistently deliver over time. And this, the, the greatest media companies of all time have done this, and the greatest content marketing examples are basically doing the same. The fourth step is harvesting audience. And what we see around very successful case studies is the that email subscribers, email newsletters are critical. So we see a lot of these companies building up their email and print subscribers and not just relying on social media connections, which they have no control over, we have no control over as we go. And once we build that audience, we diversify. And that's where you see things like, okay, we're moving from one channel, let's say a blog or a YouTube video series or an iTunes podcast, and now we're doing things like, maybe launching a print magazine or we're launching a podcast off of our blog or we're launching a webinar series. We're starting to do other things to expand that reach and, and share more of our content goodness as we know that if we do that correctly, 
our customers will know, like, and trust us more and will lead to more positive benefits for the organization. And then the sixth step, which you, you know, you got to figure out, okay, well, why are we doing this? Is it going to help the business? And that's all around monetization. And what we found out is that businesses monetize in nine different ways. They do that. Some, like media companies, do it through advertising and sponsorship, or like we do at the Content Marketing Institute through events. Uh, some want to sell more products and services. Some want to create more loyal customers. Some want to take it for data so that they can launch new products for research and development. Some do it through donations. It's a lot of different ways to make money. But what was exciting, David, is that there was there's actually a model out there that we can follow. We don't have to guess. And the only caveat to this whole thing working is time. And we know that the, the all these case studies, for the most part, they take over 12 months to really work. So if you're out there thinking about doing something in six months or less, I would say don't even try this. Go do something else. Go interrupt people. Go do advertising. But if you want to build a loyal relationship with an audience, and build an asset over time, then the contenting model is something you might want to look at. Well, yeah, thanks for that, Joe. Just taking some notes here. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some really good stuff. But for starters, I just have to say I'm a little hurt that you didn't use us as a model. <laughs> what we did for Schweiky Media when you were looking at smaller businesses. I'm, I'm a little hey, hurt, man, but I'll, I got, I'll let it go. I got another book. Hey, I'm always writing another book. So don't worry yeah. about that. I got to write a book in 2017. <laughs> so there we go. There's still plenty. We're very, very, we're there. very proud of what we've done for uh, for, for them uh, with, with it. It's just, and it's, you know, and all joking aside, we're a great, we're a great case study for you because we, it, you know, we saw it work, and then now five, six years in, it's the lifeblood of our company. It's leads coming in. I, if we don't get a few leads every day, I'm like, guys, are, are our forms broken? <laughs> you know, is something wrong? Yeah. You know, I mean, because I, you know, it's it's literally, and, and you know, if two days go by, I'm I'm not joking. I go in there, I was like, what's wrong? Something's wrong. You know, because it's it's just it works, but it does take time and it gets going. But all joking aside, I I, I definitely would love to be included in your book. <laughs> no, I <laughs> but, ab- uh, I no. Hey, I <laughs> no, 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 hearing I, that. No, yeah. well, the, the, what the point you make is really incredible because what you're you're taking in more control over your marketing and your business because you you don't have to leave it up to communicating in other people's platforms. You already mm-hmm. have the platforms built, and so once you get to a certain point, it really is a point where you're on autopilot with a lot of this stuff. You can choose yeah. to to even go more so, but as you, I mean, like we get at Content Marketing Institute right now, we get about 200 subscribers a day, and those mm-hmm. subscribers end up wow. buying lots of stuff from us and going to Content Marketing World and, and signing up for online training, but that started in 2007, so we've been doing this for nine years yeah. now, um, and yeah. a lot of people don't realize that. They want to just throw a lot of money at it quickly, thinking they can build a relationship over time, or build a relationship in a short period of time, and you, you simply can't do it. Yeah, and that, that's a challenge. But once you get into that jet stream, it's glorious. It's wonderful. It's Absolutely. calming, you know. But it's you got to get there. And that, and that's a uh, you know with with our firm, you know, magnificent marketing. You know, that's you know that's definitely um, a, a challenge where you know we undergo with the small. I wouldn't even say medium business. Medium is pretty big, decent sized business. But like the, specifically like the smaller business that's starting from scratch with no. Nothing, you know, no, no, no presence, very small presence, uh, no email list, anything like that, and people are going to want to return right away or quick enough. Uh, but it's just, you know, convincing that and understanding that. But if you can convince both sides of it, don't expect a lot right away. But once it gets going, all your pretty much all your worries about sales will, will dissipate, um, and, it, and you just got to worry about coming through with what you're offering or, you know, what your services right. are providing. So, yeah, I mean, so that's good to hear. And I really, you know, uh, it's just it's just a challenge, you know, with, with the budget. But that's a good point you brought up is, like, if you, if you need it right away, you might not want to – if you can't invest, you know, 12 months' worth of time, you might not do it. But, you know, realistically – People do, you know, for their investment, small business, you know, that's the chicken or the egg, right? I mean, you need the money to invest and, you know, you need to invest, you know, you need the sales and all that and you need to create something. So if somebody were want to get going with something, you know, needing some sales quicker than, you know, six months, but then, you know, but kind of dipping their, their toes in, would you suggest they even 
you know, try like a smaller model um, of some sort to to try to, you know, get it going and then try to get some sort of return or you all, or is it basically, hey, just understand this is going to take some time. If you don't, if you can't wait, it might not be for you. You might just need to do smaller, you know, advertisements here and there. Is that kind of your well, advice? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good point. You could start off with a pilot program. Absolutely. We talk about it in the book. You basically look at a six-month pilot program. You focus on one audience with one content type. You focus on a customer pain point that uh, that audience has, and you figure out a model where you can deliver consistently. Now, if you want to get more reach sooner because it's going to take you a while to get organic reach, it's going to take a while for you to build that audience, you might want to put some sponsorship advertising, paperclip, uh, uh, paperclip, uh, social advertising around it, whatever, so that you can get more attention faster. Um, if yeah. you're just going to do it organically, it's going to take some time. But if you want to mm -hmm. speed the cycle, you need to speed this up, let's say, because your boss is like, hey, we're going to see something in six months. You've got to put something behind it. It either has to be paid, you have to really work an influencer marketing program, and it's not to say you can't do this. Like mm -hmm. um, when we started, like when I think when I started the blog for what is now Content Marketing Institute in 2007, the first six months, it was radio silence. There wasn't mm -hmm. much going on, but we started to see some things happen between month six and month nine. So mm -hmm. it absolutely is possible, but we didn't generate direct revenue until probably mm -hmm. after 12 months. So I would mm -hmm. say, hey, if you're a small business, just be, don't do a lot. Just do one thing really, really well in one channel um, and then run it like a pilot program because you're going to see lower level indicators to start. You'll see web traffic. Uh, you'll see some downloads of ebooks. You'll see some e newsletter subscribers. Those are all really, really good things. And you just have to set the expectations in your company that to see things like sales or to see behavior change in current customers, it's going to take a little bit longer than six months. Yeah, and it's just, it's, you know, that's change. I mean, it's, I'm just, you know, it's cause it, and everyone just understand this is coming from, you know, the guy who coined the term content marketing, godfather content marketing, because you hear different, um, you know, it used to be takes three to six months, and it was like four to six months, and it was six to nine months, but it's just, it really sounds like you, you've really got your, your arms around this thing, and you're, you're looking at, hey, you really need to do it for 12 months, and then you'll, then you'll really start to see, but if you can get there, and you can invest in it, and you have the, capital to do so. I, I, I can speak from experience. Joe can speak from experience that it, it does turn into just one of the most calming things that can happen for you because and then you just set it on autopilot and keep doing what you're doing mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just keep adding some sprinkles here and there with some interactive content and, and, and this and that and you just keep going and then it just comes down to you know, really just fun creativity at that point. But you got to get there. You got to get there. Now, um, let me let me uh, circle back to what you said earlier about uh, building the strategy. I uh, sure. you know I reached out to you the other day after listening to one of your uh, content marketing podcasts uh, about help, help me with this buyer persona thing. Um, and I actually did buy the book and I actually read it already from Adele Ravella. And I actually reached out to her and I think we're going to be doing a podcast interview because I. I have a lot of questions I want to ask her, and I love her okay. book, and, and I'm, you know, sculpting my own buyer persona um, strategy as well because it is so important, and I, and I think that is something that – one thing that we could be doing better on our end that we are, are fixing and correcting, and, and we'll be doing that for um, high-consideration high, high uh, consideration type sales, you know, um, because it's, 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 it's different than uh, a business-to-consumer deal, which in just a, just a slight digression – um, and you can let me know your thoughts on this. We have seen content marketing uh, take off, uh, results take off a lot quicker when it's uh, not a high consideration, big ticket sale. I mean, that's kind of an obvious thing. But for B to C type stuff, this stuff starts working fairly fairly soon, you know, as far as getting leads in. But for the you know the big decision, C level, C suite type decision makers, we're seeing it take a, a, a lot longer to start seeing results. Um, I don't know if you've seen that as well. Um, I guess can you comment on that real quick? Well, I mean, if you if when we have people come to us and they they talk about the timetable, I always want to know. Well, what's the buyer's journey? How long does the buyer's journey take? And they'll say, Good generally, point. if you're a B two B company, you see it anywhere from nine to twelve months, sometimes longer. Sometimes with big heavy industrial equipment, it might be twelve to eighteen months, or even longer than that. 
So my response back is, well, you have to at least go through one buyer's journey to know yeah. if this thing's going to work. That's so a good how point. Can you, you can't say, yeah, you can't say, hey, we want this to work in six months and say, oh, well, our buyer's journey is 18 months. I'm like, you're kidding yourself. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't set yourself up for failure. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, if your buyer's journey is, is more of a, on a consumer basis and it's much shorter, yes, it, you can absolutely see some results in a quicker period of time. But the, the, what I would probably say, let's just go back to, to a B2B example. You have any, any B2B company has seven to nine decision makers, influencers, gatekeepers in that process. As you create your content marketing approach, what you want to do is focus on one of those. So that's why it's really important to figure out who you're talking to because if you're talking to multiple audiences at the same time, let's say you want to talk to a CFO and a CEO at the same time. Well, good luck with that. They have very different needs and different pain points, and you're never going to be relevant enough if you focus on more than one. So what you want to do is just focus on one and think smaller from that standpoint. Be the leading expert in a very small particular niche to, a, to one audience and not expand yourself. And I think that's where you're going to have the most impact. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, we, we, we literally could do an entire podcast just on this, so we won't we won't um, dig into this too deep. But I, I do want to just uh, restate, you know, Joe uh, told me to read this book from Adele Ravella. It's A-D-E-L-E. Uh, R-E-V-E-L-L-A, and it's called Buyer Personas. And uh, thanks for that advice, Joe, and, I, and, I, and I'll pass it on to everybody else that um, do go buy that book. It's, it adds so much light on kind of what Joe's talking about, about picking the buyer persona, seven to nine decision makers, but you still got to focus. Then you got to see, you know, what they're, you know, to build your strategy, you got to start there specifically for medium to high consideration type of um, purchases and um, sales cycle. So uh, we'll, um, we'll we'll move on here because, I, again, like I said, that that's a whole, whole long conversation. But, um, yeah, but uh, th- thanks for that, Joe. You, you, and you shed some light for me on, I, I just, was like, why is this working so much quicker for them versus that? But yeah, it's the buying cycle. If that's, that's if right. that's a week long decision, that's a big difference between a six month long decision. So man, that's, that's why. Exactly right. You yeah, got it. I, I was doing a B to C, B to B, but no, that's not what it is. It's the buying cycle. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, okay, for the strategy part of the Content Inc. model, you recommend a content marketing mission statement. Can you explain exactly what that is and why uh, a company should create one? Well, it's interesting, David. Um, so I've, as you know, you know, you and I have known each other a long time. I come from the publishing arena, and I have had the pleasure to be on about 35 to 40 different launches of media products, whether those are print magazines, newsletters, webinar programs, uh, web content platforms, whatever the case is. I've been on a number of them. And every time we launch one, this is from a media company mentality, we always start the first day or two as we're doing the strategy, we create an editorial mission statement. It's just standard. Well, why, why do we do that? Because we want to know exactly who we're targeting, we want to know exactly what we're going to deliver, and we want to know exactly what's in it for the audience. And if we stay on point with that over a long period of time, we will be successful as a media company. And then, David, as I started to do research into all these different brands, small, medium size, and large, what I realized is, is that hardly any of them create an editorial mission statement. They just don't do it because we focus so much on the stories we want to tell. We're not focused on what do we need to tell, what do we need to talk with, with this audience, and what do they need to get out of every piece of content. So that's why we want to talk about creating this thing called the content marketing mission statement. So whether you done content marketing before or whether you already have a program, you want to go back to each audience and create a singular singular mission for each one. And that mission would be who specifically are we targeting for this initiative? Are we targeting an engineer? Are we targeting the CFO? Are we targeting a plant manager? To your point about a buyer persona, it needs to link to somebody that we're trying to target in some way. Then what are we going to deliver? Are we going to deliver simple tips? Is it going to be long form content? What, what does the content look like and feel like so we have an understanding and set an expectation for what we're going to deliver? And then the most important is what's in it for the audience? So what, what's the outcome? Are we trying to help them get a better job, live a better life? This is not right now about us selling more widgets. It's all about helping the audience in some way. So if we can put this document together and we can get it in front of every, everybody that creates content for us, our employees, our influencers, freelancers, agency, whatever, 
everybody will be on the same page. You will immediately see an ROI in editing costs because now the people that are creating the content, they know why they're doing it. They have the vision in front of them at all times. Everyone's on the same page. And you know as you create every individual piece of content that, that each one has an outcome. What is the purpose of that blog post? What, is the, what are we trying to do for that audience? What's the purpose of that webinar? Sometimes we forget because we're so focused on sales. We're like, oh, we got to deliver more leads. We got it. What's going to help us do that? We want to start with the audience first and say, what's in it for them? What are the, what are the pain points they need to solve? Is it in line with our mission? And then we go and figure out, okay, now we're going to communicate this way. This makes the most sense, and everybody's focused on the audience. So I'm kind of on a mission <laughs> myself, David, to make sure that more companies do this because it's what's made media companies great since the dawn of time, and it's a very simple thing that most companies just don't do. Yeah, that's definitely what clarity and focus. Uh, do you have a place where you can direct somebody to see an example of a content marketing mission statement? Yeah, absolutely. We have a ton on the site. So actually, if you type in, if you go to Google, the knower of all things Google, and you type in content marketing mission statement, I probably have written 10 articles on it. So, all right. Well, yeah, I, I trust that Google's going to show our stuff up first. Uh, I've, I've written a couple specifically, and then, of course, in the book, Content Inc., as well as Epic Content Marketing, all kinds of examples. So I use examples from media as well as from brands, small companies, and large companies. Like I think I got one from Procter & Gamble. I've got a number of small company examples as well on that. So just Google Content Marketing Mission Statement, and they'll pop right up for you. I just did, Joe, and I don't see you anywhere. No, I'm joking. You're in the top two. <laughs> yep, it's right there. <laughs> You're scaring me, man. I was no. going to have to call my search engine optimization guy. We would have edited that, that out. No. Um, <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. You're the top two spots. Um, okay, cool. Thank you for that. I'm going to dig into that as well. Um, I'm just going to keep it open on my Google here, and I'll, I'm going to check it out after we hang up. Because, yeah, that, uh, mean, I, I feel like we do a pretty decent job of that, but at the same time, um, I, I do think we, we, we personally could get better. I know most people could get better, and I'll just say it's starting – once you start, you know what you need to do. You really start, you know, just starting to just, okay, I'm really understanding this now. And you've got to kind of start at that end and work work backwards. Um, exactly. And it, it just it makes it so much easier, too. And that, that's another thing, everyone. You know, this stuff, for everyone who is looking to get into marketing or content marketing or anything, understand by doing some of this – Semi heavy lifting um, at the beginning. We're not. It's not more work. It's going to make less work, and it's going to make it easier for everybody. And you're not going to be running around, you know, just in all different areas. You're, you're going to be focused, and it's going to be easier for you. And, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, it's literally just going to be so much more simple um, to, to move forward with your plan when you're actually running it. So do a little bit of work at the beginning, figure all that out, and then you just basically just keep putting coals in the fire, as I like to like to say, basically. Yep. So measure measure, twi measure twice, cut once. That's it. There you go. It's just the same thing with anything. We want to yep. do a strategy first, then we execute. We don't want to execute and then figure out our strategy after. Exactly. All right, your third step. It's called building the base, uh, and this is not something that most companies do. Uh, wh why is that, and wh why do you recommend simplifying your approach here? Uh. Boy, it's interesting now that, you know, we've, we had eight different channels we could communicate with consumers before 1990, and today we've got hundreds if not thousands of different ways to communicate. In a lot of those cases, it's free. It doesn't cost us, you know, hard cost anything to do that, to publish in Facebook, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, the Medium, uh, to, you know, it's very inexpensive to do an e-newsletter, to do lots of things it doesn't cost a ton of money, and, and I think what we've gotten into a rut here, David, where we believe that uh, we should just because we can, and that's a, that's the wrong way to go with this. And what we found out is that, and this is interesting, I mean, just from my, I love history, and I always go back and say, well, how did the New York Times start? How did the Washington Post start? How did ESPN start? And do all research. You know, it's funny, they all started the same way, and we're saying the same thing with the content marketing approaches from companies like Red Bull or Marriott or Procter & Gamble. They've all done it the same way, and basically what they do is they focus for the most part, when they start and target an audience, they focus on one content type for the most part. Is it audio? Is it video? Is it textual plus image? 
and then they focus on one content channel. Is it my blog or website? Is it a magazine? Is it um, is it iTunes? Is it uh, is it YouTube for videos? And then they consistently deliver. And when I say consistently, I mean like on the minute. Every day we're going to deliver. So if you said, okay, we're going to do three blog posts a week, I'm going to say, no, you're not. You're doing a blog. You're releasing a blog post at 7 a.m. on Monday, 7 a.m. on Wednesday, 7 a.m. on Friday. That kind of consistency. That's a promise. And and what we saw in all these case studies is everyone keeps that promise and they deliver consistently. And then the fourth step, and we've talked about this, is time. It takes generally over 12 months to get this up and running. So it's those four things about building the base. And I think what a lot of businesses are doing out there right now is they're just they're, they have lots of stories they want to tell, and we spread it all over the place instead of focusing on building that core and that hub, and that's what's shown to be successful. And, and I'm not just making this stuff up. I mean, this is what the data tells us. These are what the companies that are actually doing they're doing this successfully, and then you get then you diversify once you build that audience. And I just wish more companies would do that instead of feeling like they have to communicate 13, 15, 20 different ways to an audience. They really need to start by being great at one and doing that really, really well. And to kind of clarify what you're saying, I, you know, you're saying 12, 13 different you know, methods or channels. But, for instance, if you are doing like the written word blog and you're putting it out, you're not saying to not, you know, it is easy to, you know, you want to push it out to the markets, um, to the channels, like if it, be it Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever, you know, put the ad dollars in the ones that make most sense for whatever, you know, it, it, there's no one answer for that. There's hundred answers, thousands yeah. of answers. But you're not saying to not post in those other places and not push it out on those other places because you can't easily do that through, like, you know, scheduling through Buffer or whatever. You're just – that you're not saying not to push it out those places. You're just saying focus on the one channel, be it, you know, a YouTube channel or a, a blog, and focus, you know, your ad dollars on the ones that matter the most. But, you know, you can go ahead and distribute them on Google Plus and, and, and throughout other places. Is that – is yeah, I'm, exactly. That right? I'm not talking. To, yes, I'm not talking about content promotion. There's lots of yeah. things we could do with prom, with promoting that content and how you feel it is best. But okay. what I'm going to say is, let's say that you figure out your content marketing mission statement. Uh, you're not going to launch a magazine, a blog, a podcast, a webinar series all at the same time. Okay. You should focus. Exactly. You should create one of those things. Deliver consistently. Build your audience. Focus on email subscription. And then, yes, you're probably going to say there's three or four key ways we're going to promote that content. Some of that could be paid. Some of that could be social promotion where it really makes sense to do that, uh, although a lot of companies do that very, very poorly. Uh, but, yes, yeah, so we want to focus and choose one and put the other ones to the side until you build a minimum viable audience on that one platform, and then you can expand and diversify off of that. Gotcha. Thanks for the clarification there. You got it. All right. Uh, you often say uh, don't build your house on rented land when it comes to social media. Why not? Well, I love social media as much as you do. I mean, you know I've got, I'm have got i fairly active on the social platforms, and I think that it's, uh, it's amazing that we have these, uh, these ways to communicate with our customers. But the fact is is that we have no control over our connections in those platforms. And Facebook has showed us that that's true. Whereas when we started, you know, let's say 07, 08, 09, and you were a brand and you were a company and you got somebody that was following you that liked your page, the odds were that if you, if you delivered something organically through your Facebook page, they would actually see it. The people that liked your page would actually see it. Now, today that's not true. If you are a brand and you have over 10,000 people that like your page, less than 1% of the people that like that page will actually see an organic update from you. So Facebook has done – and by the way, Facebook, they can do that. They want to make money, and they've done a masterful job of making money. And they said, hey, brands, if you want to get in touch with people on our platform, you're going to have to pay, and brands came through, and they absolutely paid. And now LinkedIn starting to look at this. So if you're on LinkedIn, you don't see everybody's updates that you're connected with. I'm sure Twitter is going to go that direction. Um, and we're going to see that over in Google Plus. Google, you know, Google doesn't even know what to do with Google Plus. And we don't even know where we're going with that right now. Um, no, have we so ever? The point, <laughs> have we ever? That's point. That's that's exactly. That's a great point. 
So the point is, is that use social media, leverage it, but you should get up with the mentality every day that it could be gone because we don't control those platforms. So I want you to focus on the platforms you actually have the most control over. And that's why I love email. It's yeah, exactly I do why I think email is the, is the best. If you're, we, I talk about my, the subscriber hierarchy and we do it at Content Marketing Institute. At the top of that subscriber hierarchy is email and then print. Because that's where we have print subscribers, email subscribers. We have the most control to get that data and to leverage that data and communicate directly. Way at the bottom is Facebook and YouTube because we just don't have a lot of control. Even if somebody likes my YouTube page, I don't, I'm, I don't know if they're actually going to see my videos because YouTube's going to do whatever they want with their algorithm. So we just have to make sure that we focus on that. I've, I've felt bad for a lot of marketers that put millions of dollars into their Facebook page. They had millions of people like that page. And now they can't communicate with them anymore. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's uh, that's definitely frustrating. So, uh, in in regards to that, like instant articles for like publishers or whatever. Wh what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting. I mean, Facebook. And by the by the way, Facebook opened that up to brands too. I just saw today yeah. that uh, that Intel is now publishing on instant articles. So you've got. Washington Post publishing a thousand articles, and, and you've got the New York Times publishing 500 articles a day through Facebook. You know, I don't know what to make of that. I'm concerned. If I'm Washington Post and the New York Times, first of all, they're not making money off of that, so they're mm -hmm. trying to derive revenue. They're trying not much money, so they're trying to derive revenue other ways by them going back to the site. They're not seeing people go back to those sites because why would they? They can stay on Facebook and get all the content that they want to with instant articles. I, I. I think there is some value if you're a brand and you want and you have a certain story that you want to tell consistently, and if they can get that access to that through instant articles a little bit better, then great. It's very, very tough to measure. It's getting very cluttered on Facebook right now. I honestly don't know what the future of instant articles is, uh, but I know what Facebook is trying to do. They're trying to create a walled garden. They want yeah. everything to stay on Facebook. You never have to leave. They're doing a darn good job of it. And it, as, a, as a marketer, it, it concerns me. I honestly don't know what the future of that will be. Yeah, the one decent thing about Facebook, though, and I guess it's more of a law of nature than it is any sort of altruism by Facebook, but it's um, they're going to have to do something that works for everybody. You know, advertisers and and the and the the user base. You know, obviously they need to probably think user base first, just like the content marketing approach is. But eventually they're going to have to worry about you know the people who keep their business stock <laughs> going up, right? And the people who pay them. So they're going to have to figure something out that it works for everybody. But yeah, I mean it's that's why I just brought it up kind of randomly here, because I'm just curious too. Like, what, what you know, I don't know what to think of it. It it just goes against. Everything to the point of all this is, you know, driving people to your website so you can capture them at least, at the very least, to let them see, um, oh, they have something to sell that I might like, right, or I might be able to use. And you get people there and you build the trust and then immediately it's right there. And, of course, there's other ways to go about that through retargeting ads and whatnot. But you really want to get people on, on, on your platform, be it YouTube or your, your blog page or your website or something, you know. So, you know, I've just – I don't know. I'm still still well, I mean, look verdict at, out for instant articles at, for me. Yeah, I mean, look at look at BuzzFeed. I mean, BuzzFeed, they, their latest earnings and revenue report came out, and they they took a big hit. Why did they take a hit? Because Facebook and other social media platforms aren't sharing their content like they used to. Go figure. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't see that coming. And mm -hmm. so, what's BuzzFeed trying to do? They're trying to get as many and many email subscribers as they possibly can. That's yeah. their core goal right now because. BuzzFeed management is freaking out because they built their entire business model on the back of other companies that they have no control over. Now it's coming home to roost. They're in trouble. They're trying to figure out a new business model, and that's around email. So, I mean, that might work, but they're a little bit late when it yeah. comes to this. So anybody listening to this really want to focus on email as your number one. Now, is that going to be the case a year from now? I don't know, but right now it is. And email is going to change for a in a long year. time. Yeah. yeah. No, well, emails I mean, are around. I mean, they ain't going anywhere. And and what we see from the from people always say, but millennials don't engage in email. That's not true. Every research true, project, yeah. each research I've seen is is millennials, in some cases, engage in more email uh, mm -hmm. than than regular folks. So it's uh, than regular folks. That's so funny. But uh, 
But, but we're anyway, getting old, the, Joe. We're getting old. Yeah, exactly. You and I, man. Uh, what are you going to do? But anyway, so focus on email. I think we're going to be okay. It's funny you say that because I, I definitely, you know, get some resistance slash, you know, raised eyebrows when I'm we have to I was like we have to incorporate an email approach like we just it's have to I mean it's it's a no-brainer part of the equation and people just look at that as oh that's old you know and it's it's isn't it funny that it's like considered you know you I mean it's easy to see how print could be considered old school media and radio and TV and billboard just because they've been around since pretty much all of us have been alive uh, but you know now like email marketing is starting to be considered like old school and I just think that that's just funny because it's not that I mean I think I was a senior in college when I first got email right access to email I mean I guess I'm gonna date myself like 20 years ago but still that's not that big of a period of time but it's it's just it's it's so vital and I'm glad you're saying that because yep. it it goes exactly with what we've uh we believe in and it's just and, and it's so inexpensive i e basically free <laughs> you know so uh you got you gotta use email I'm glad you're bringing that up so on that note, you recommend that companies even small ones should look at purchasing subscribers and websites is that really something a small business should do uh Man, I, I'm going to take you back to my publishing days again. And every time before we launched a new, uh, onto a new platform targeting a new audience, we always looked out and said, is there anybody else doing this right now that we could possibly purchase? I've been involved in a number of deals. Some of these deals are five figures, meaning they didn't cost very much money to do, to purchase a, a blogger site, an influencer site, going into a media site. So the point is, is that we're talking about how much time it takes, and it does. It takes a lot of time. But what if there was already a platform out there that you could purchase and you sort of cut your time out of there and you can get right to, to really making some impact because it already exists, they already have subscribers built. And so I would just at least do the exercise. And we're, see, we're gonna see this, um, I, there's a, a business uh, two weeks ago, Aero Electronics, Fortune 500 electronics company, purchased a number of uh, websites and media platforms from UBM who's our parent company, and which is really interesting that they're going out and they're purchasing webs they're purchasing media companies, media brands. And I think that we're going to see more of this. We saw L'Oreal purchase Makeup.com. We saw Johnson & Johnson purchase Baby Center. You're going to see more and more of this happen because brands have money and they don't have patience. And I think that this could be, this is an opportunity for not just a large business, so for small businesses, what we've done, we've at Content Marketing Institute, we're a relatively small company, and we've done it three times ourselves. So it's, there's, there's absolutely an opportunity to do that, and I think that's just good strategy. And if you don't do it, I think you're, you're, you're missing a big opportunity. Now, what about, uh, you know, small businesses obviously probably don't have the opportunity, or it'd be harder for them at least. What about, you know, building applicable lists for people? You know, because building, I will say that building email subscribers, it's 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 a little bit even slower. You know, for the you know the, the you know circling back to that you know Schweiken Media who we helped out. You know, we we get faster YouTube subscribers than we do email subscribers, and it just and it just takes time. And uh, you know, way back when, and you can tell me this is a bad strategy, and I'll. I'll take my lumps with it. But way back when, you know, uh, years ago, you know, we got some lists of publishers. You know, you you can, you know, from either conferences we went to that they didn't necessarily sign up, or uh, you know, build, you know, buying publishing lists. And I know that there's been a big faux pas on it, which I'm even a little nervous to even bring up to you because I could have egg on my face here. But um, we went ahead and did that because we had to kickstart it. And now we made it super crazy easy to unsubscribe, you know, on the top and the bottom. You know, we want we want you out. And we obviously also used a very, very top platform, email, uh, email platform, so we could monitor any sort of spam complaints. And we didn't see any negative effects. We only saw positive effects. We never, and I know it's, you know, it's just, it's like pop-ups. People like, ooh, pop-ups. I'm going to say they're bad because the market, it's almost like being PC by saying you hate pop-ups. But the fact of the matter is they work. And, and, and again, it, it's, you know, PC to say, oh, I hate, you know, don't buy your list. Don't do that. You know, earn it. But 
you know, if you're a small business and you got to get kickstarted, and and I'm seeing, you know, if we have a really good reach with the with the Schweiki over all this time, but even that takes a while to build up the email list. So I'm glad we did what we did because those people have converted to customers. Because, but again, we have we only deliver. You know, you've been involved in our content plan from the very beginning. We only deliver super crazy high, amazing content now. We don't blast mm-hmm. them with with buy offers ever. It's only content. It's only good. So with that being said, for like a small business, you can't purchase subscribers or a website. But should you look into building your lists or is that – do you – are you well, yeah, saying I mean, no to that? So, no, no, no. So basically, if you, let's, let's say you're going to rent, rent a list. You, if you rent a list or you get a list, however you get that, the people on that list haven't necessarily opted into your content. You have right. your name. You can send the promotion out to them, and at, the best way to do it – is to ask them if they would like to subscribe. You can give them a sample. Here's what we're going to send you. Would you like to subscribe to this? Give them a chance to to opt into that. Okay. Uh, that's the that's the absolute best way to do it. There's lots of other gray areas, but you want to make sure that if they haven't opted in to the to the ongoing, let's say it's an email newsletter, you don't just want to necessarily add them to the list. You want to give them the opportunity to opt in. And of course, you can talk all day long about different gray areas and way to do it. The best way to do it is, yes, you get a list, however you get that. Let's say you worked with a, an, an event, you uh, let's say that you were exhibiting there, and you got a list as part of that package. You can't just add them to your, li- to your opt-in newsletter list or anything like that. You can add them to your promo list, and then you can send them a promotion in order to get them to sign up ongoing for your whatever your great content is. That's the best way to do it. Gotcha. All right, thanks. I was a little nervous, to ask that. <laughs> but you know, but but hey, I you know, it is what it is. Um, it is what it all is. Right, well, That's right. Do you uh, have any any parting thoughts? I and, and definitely appreciate all your insight, and I know everybody else will too. Um, do you have any any parting thoughts for um, you know small medium type of business or you know even a larger business that that um, is going to be undertaking content marketing? Well, I mean, I guess the thing that I would want to leave somebody with is just make a decision whether or not you're going to commit to it. Start small, focus on one audience, and and focus on an area where you actually can be the leading expert in the world at something. So that might be a very small particular niche that that's around your focus area that you have credibility and authority to communicate on, and then follow the model. The model is 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 shown that it works. Uh, just follow that model. You don't have to figure out okay, how do we do this. Um, you can follow a lot of companies that have already done it for the last hundred years. Uh, we talk about that in the book. And then you can just move forward and just make sure you set expectations properly with your team so that they understand that it's going to take a little bit of time to really, really make inroads. But it's going to be worth it in the long run because at the end of the day, you're going to build an audience. That audience is an asset. They'll become to know, like, and trust you. And when they know, like, and trust you, they'll be more willing to buy from you. Thank you so much for that. Now, how can people uh, buy your book, Content Inc., and or continue to learn from you? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, content-inc.com is the landing page. It has all the places that you can buy Content Inc. It's got a free chapter. You can sign up for all the other goodies that we have available. Uh, I've also got a Content Inc. podcast that I release every Monday, so you can subscribe, subscribe to that on iTunes if you want to, and then everything for Content Marketing Institute, contentmarketinginstitute.com, and, and then the big event coming up every September is Content Marketing World, and we're expecting uh, about 4,000 people from 60 countries this year, so we're pretty excited about it. Wonderful. Now, on iTunes, what would they type in? Uh, yeah, just type in my name. Uh, P- just type in Polizzi, P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I, and I've got, we've got two podcasts up there. One's called Content Inc., that's my own. That's a, like a five-minute podcast. And then our weekly content marketing news podcast is This Old Marketing, and that's with Robert Rose. And if you want to know, get the, the news of the week in the industry, uh, Robert and I talk about that every week. All right. Well, thank you, sir. And, and uh, if you want to follow Joe on Twitter, it's just at J-O-E-P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I. All right, Joe. Well, thank you again for your time. Uh, it was wonderful talking with you and uh, looking forward to uh, possibly having you on again soon. Anytime, my friend. Thanks for all the support. Really appreciate it. Thank you.